welcome to this edition of Trader Talk TV. And today we've got Alan Kay from SpotX in the office. Thanks for coming in. Alan. Yeah, thanks for having us. And today we're going to talk about uh, connected TV. It's uh, a big area of um, the TV ecosystem, which a lot of people don't know about. But um, there is confusion around it, and Alan's in here today to talk about the difference between uh, connected TV and programmatic TV. But before we do that, Alan, just give us an overview of what you do at SpotX. Yeah, so uh, my name is Alan Kosowski. I work for uh, SpotX uh, overseeing the connected television and mobile initiatives, um, kind of in between the business groups and the product and engineering teams. Thank you, Alan. So, Alan, let's talk about connected TV and talk about it versus programmatic TV. So, what's the difference between those two ecosystems? So, maybe if you can draw that out and give some explanation of what the differences are between the two. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'll give you some insight, too, into kind of where the term OTT has come from. So if we're really looking at um, kind of the connected television ecosystem, we're thinking about delivery of, you know, video to a television set, right? So you've got from, you've got your connected TV, uh, you've got your programmatic TV, and you've got your advanced TV. And essentially, from this uh, connected TV, you've got things like set-top boxes, you've got the little sticks, um, you've got gaming consoles here, you've got all these things that could essentially bring a video into um, to a TV screen. Now, the set-top boxes um, are traditionally kind of delivered to in a closed ecosystem that is controlled by the pay TV provider. So, you know, excuse my handwriting here because I failed that in, in grade school. But essentially what happens is you've got the source of the content kind of over here, and this is delivered through a completely closed ecosystem to the set-top box. And this, in this completely closed ecosystem, is kind of where the, uh, if you think about programmatic TV and advanced TV, that's where that lives. It's this, this uh, completely kind of closed in network infrastructure uh, that's happened over, over years. So we'll say this is the source of the video. What we're seeing now is actually the fact that there's another way to deliver content, right? And that's through the internet. That is IP delivered content. Now, not to be confused, this in here can also be IP delivered content. Mm. So if we're thinking about this here, this can be delivered uh, by analog, it can be delivered uh, maybe even you know, um, by IP. There's, there's lots of ways to do it. But essentially, if you take that source video and you can deliver it through the internet to the stick, to a set-top box, to a gaming console, uh, to a Blu-ray player, to anything that's connected to the, to the TV or the TV itself, this is connected television. And that's, it can be app-based, it can look like another channel, but essentially it's the idea that this is, the content is delivered over the internet and the reason that it's called over the top is because this content has been delivered over the infrastructure of the provider. So that's gone over the top of the existing infrastructure and it can be delivered to any device. Interestingly enough, uh, this opens up a lot of options because it also means it can be delivered to mobile devices and tablets and desktops and all of these other things. But for the purpose of today, what I'm defining as connected TV sits right here, right? This is the connected TV. Okay. This, any sort of dynamic or data-driven um, or programmatic TV delivered this way um, would be considered to be uh, programmatic or uh, addressable TV. Okay. So that's two differences between, the, um, between connected and the, and the sort of programmatic mm -hmm. piece. So talk about like the, the type of sort of inventory uh, and the way the inventory is sold in the connected TV space. So is it, a, is it an RTV open auction uh, piece or are, is it more of a case of like um, uh, prepaid deals, PMP deals, um, agreements between media seller and, and buyer? Yeah, so what we actually see in this space is since so much of this inventory is actually originating, originating from, um, you know, uh, premium uh, sellers of inventory. So we're seeing it from uh, MVPDs, pay TV providers, uh, you know, very premium broadcasters are the ones that are really kind of um, taking the leap, I think, here in connected television. Mm. As long, and there's many other players too that are kind of medium and long tail. But um, what we're seeing is that all of those people already have sales teams. So yeah. they have big sales teams, they have existing relationships with brands and buyers and agencies. Um, but at the same time, the brands and buyers and agencies are starting to uh, look at the connected TV and they say, okay, this is delivered over the internet, right? So I want to be able to take the things that I do in a digital environment. So this, this, this is hard. I have to, in an addressable TV, I have to take, take some creative and I have to kind of hand it off to you. 
This is open. It doesn't require a big infrastructure upgrade. So the agencies or buyers are saying, well, okay, listen, we do want to buy in this environment, but if you are going to be enabled here, we want to be able to apply our data. We want to be able to, to access this programmatically. We want to be able to do the same buy that we did, but we want to do it through our DSP or mm -hmm. our trading desk in order to access that inventory, and we want to get the similar insights that we would get in digital. So. Uh, we're going to look at um, if it's available, are there going to be click-through rates? It's, not every platform has it. Uh, View-through rates. We want to look at things like how this matches our audience, how this matches our, our geo, how this was delivered against reach and frequency. Mm. So they're able to do that now because since they can access all of this inventory and they can get kind of in the middle here, because essentially where, where SpotX would, would end up kind of sitting in this process is kind of somewhere, I think kind of right in here, right? Yeah. And inside here, this is where kind of SpotX is right now and you've got you know essentially the sales team of uh the sales team uh of the the, the media owner sitting out here you've got the dsp um and then you've got uh the agencies and buyers so you've got the brands down here right these guys are on the phone talking to each other directly but the transaction is occurring this way and data is being applied somewhere in here and this is where data is, is kind of occurring um, either in here or in here, depending on um, who's bringing the data to the table. So what we find is that in our marketplace specifically, um, that what's happening is, um, is, is really the, the idea is like 93% of all this inventory is being transacted um, by, uh, by private marketplaces. So this is not going into an open marketplace. These are, these are locked. So these are, these, are, these are invite only, and these are set up either on the fly or they're you know, kind of pre-existing where um, you won't see in the open marketplace. So if you're sitting on the DSP side and you're just saying, I'm going to go look and see how much connected television inventory, you're going to say, well, there's not that much. But that's because it hasn't been unlocked through. It's these two people have to talk first and agree. So, it agreed, so it's a PMP, so the deal has to be agreed. And then the, 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 the buyer says to the publisher that I will buy 100% of your inventory if it matches my audience, but I'm going to buy at this agreed price. Right. So there's no actual, you know, it's it's, it's a typical sort of a PMP thing that you say I would commit to this if I see my audience, and I'm going to use my data to see if my if my audience is available mm -hmm. on your inventory. That's right. And we're going to do this programmatically in the sense we're going to do it via um, SpotX's um, uh, exchange uh, to help us facilitate this buy. Right. So what we do is is we are providing uh, in many instances we are providing. Um, we're actually acting as a direct ad server. So mm. for uh, many of our clients, we are the ad server here. We're in there. That call comes out. The All the deals and terms and everything are, are defined by the sales team. Um, but SpotX is the primary ad server. So in that instance, um, all the deals, all the direct sold deals um, that are occurring um, are then uh, being, uh, SpotX is determining at that point uh, what the best deal is to serve at any given point to, to maximize the yield for uh, the sales team. And it's much less of, I, I think, kind of an exchange as if you think of it as a, of a platform that connects with the buyers through the DSPs um, really for uh, managing direct deals. This is very similar to what you would have done uh, several years ago with just a primary uh, ad server, except now instead of having the hard assets, and, and our platform does support hard assets and, and taking tags directly if that's that's needed. Um, but what you're seeing is because of the idea that, that this data can be applied, and, and as a matter of fact, this brand may be doing a connected TV buy with more than one uh, media owner at any given time for a campaign, it's much easier for them to just kind of roll that all up in here. And so the preference is starting to move this direction to be able to use their DSP as a primary trading what about What about pre-approval of creatives and all that kind of thing? I mean, that's a, obviously a big thing for, 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 uh, for um, uh, brand owners. Yeah, there's a couple things that we have. So like, for example, um, in this particular instance, when that creative gets returned, so the deal ID gets set up, when that creative gets returned, we have something here um, called Creative Review. Okay, And what happens is um, their team goes in and they actually see the ad as it comes in over the wire. They're notified that the ad came in. They go in, they click it, gives them an interface to watch the ad. Mm. They say, yep, uh, they see all the categorization, everything else around the ad. They click check, and then um, that can start transacting into that inventory. And uh, is this, so are these deals pre approved How long does the typical campaigns run then, basically? So like, I mean, if you have, deals are done, a price is struck up between the brand and, and publisher, and then, the in, the intermediaries get involved in terms of like transacting this deal, so how and um, is is it run for three or four months or 
how, how does it generally work? So, because obviously what you hear that um, a lot of publishers sold out, right? They, right. I mean, video publishers, because there's no inventory right. available, right? Like in the UK, you've got like three big publishers who kind of lock down the entire mar- uh, TV market. Right. So is this sort of like, is this sort of unsold inventory or is it kind of, are they looking at everything basically to do this? Yeah. Are they moving in that direction? So they're, they're, they're moving in the direction where this all kind of goes into kind of a programmatic guarantee mm. bucket, right? Mm. So it's the same idea that you took a, a direct campaign. It's just now transacted into the trading desk because that's easier for the brand and the brand wants it that mm. way, right? Uh, the, a lot of this is being driven from the buy side because this is how they're expecting to transact, particularly um, when it comes to digital. And, and connected TV, because it is connected to the internet in this way, is so close to digital that all of this inventory can kind of be transacted right now in the existing framework. Yeah. So if you if you look at that, I mean, to answer your question about how long the normal campaign is, they can run a week, they can run three months. Um, I, don't, I don't think I see that many that run past three months, mm-hmm. but certainly um, you could see that happening. And this whole process now is getting uh, so streamlined between the buyers and the sellers because this is becoming, you know, particularly we're seeing a lot of this in the U.S. where this is becoming uh, very, very normal. This whole process only takes a few hours from the time that you get uh, the time. These two have happened to the deal IDs are set up to the creative review comes in uh, as long as all the sides are coordinated. Now, you always have the... uh, the issues where you know the brands have talked and yet they haven't brought the creative over yet to upload into the DSP or whatever that might be. But once that's ready to go, the activation process is very very quick. What about use cases? Talk about some of your clients using it. You know, you're, you're working with um, uh, Dish in the U.S. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So Dish is a great example. So what Dish has actually done um, is they've been able to model off their own first party data, and, and part of this is to kind of increase their overall yields and by applying data, right? So they've been able to model their first party data. Um, into this environment and across all screens, it's connected television um, and it's um, you know mobile and desktop. And and it, for those of uh, you who don't know what Sling uh, Sling TV is, it's essentially Dish Networks, um, yeah, a kind of pay TV service mm. that is delivered uh, completely via IP over the internet. So if you think of it, um, you know I guess maybe a similarity here might be uh, Sky Now. Okay. Uh, and so the idea is you sign up, it's a pay TV package, you can get 20 channels, you can get 60 channels, you can add sports, you can add movies, you can do whatever you want. It's live, it's linear, it's, um, and, it, and it works out of the box on Xbox and Amazon Fire and Roku's and all these different devices, right? Essentially, a pay TV package you can put in your pocket, you can take anywhere, you can go home, you can watch it on your, mm. on your TV, mm. follows you everywhere. So the idea of that is that there's live and linear. Um, and then there's also VOD catch up and all of these other things that are part of that. And then Dish has brought their own first party data into the equation. So this is where this gets interesting because the sales team has worked and the media owner has done that. And what they've done is they've gone into um, and they've, they've basically created these data segments that, that they can then use to create an overlay on top of these deals. So they can say, all right, if you are looking, um, you know, in the instance of Dish, if you are looking for an auto intender, we have modeled our own uh, data and they have um, just a, a ton of subscribers and they have all that data that, that relates to that and so they, they kind of anonymously map that to create segments and say all right we can create a uh, PMP or a deal ID that has this segment overlaid already and uh, you know supply that right out to the DSP and then they have a rate for that that may be different than a rate without data applied and that's how they they plan on or, and, and that's you, how the industry is planning on raising yields. So you think that it would actually have Raise yields uh, for, by applying data like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, and you're still going to have reach buyers, right? So right. if you think about that, I mean, if you think about how you know, like traditional TV has been, um, particularly as this scales out, there's always going to be, um, you know, your consumer goods uh, people who are going to come in and they're they're going to want to sell toothpaste or shampoo or whatever it is, and, and they want to go with reach, which is fine. Well, but that the performance can, that guys can be really interested in this because actually, you know, it gets more granular and you could do some interesting stuff around performance. Well, yeah, and we've seen some really interesting case studies on that. So, um, you know, if you look at the way that um, that's actually occurring, you can get into segments where you traditionally wouldn't even run campaigns that now you can kind of open up and say, all right, I can get very, very granular in the data. And the interesting thing about this too is, so in this, this particular case with Dish, they're bringing in first party data, but you can also bring in third party data inside this, this uh, transaction and you can kind of work on any kind of pre-agreed upon uh, first party or third party data. So there's a lot of third party data that can be applied across all these devices You've got the users that are essentially mapped in cross-device graphs, or you're using, in some instances, deterministic logins. And then you can, you can kind of plan a campaign that runs across multiple devices with whether it be the, da- the, the uh, media owner's first-party data or any off-the-shelf third-party mm. data that you can bring in. And what this enables um, 
you know, really the, the media owners to do is kind of compete um, with a lot of kind of the walled gardens when it comes to the idea of being able to uh, use and apply data because then you can take it and you can forecast how many users in that segment. Mm. You can sell that segment for a rate that would be higher than what your baseline rate would be. And if you can take, if you, let's just, for easy math, if you can take 10 million impressions and you can chunk them into $1 million, uh, or uh, 10 million impressions, you can chunk them into $1 million uh, impression buckets, and then you can use data across that to raise the yield of all of them, you're raising the yield of that whole pool. Mm. And in some instances, that, that has a, 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 uh, a significant um, impact on overall yields. How big do you think this market could be? I mean, it's interesting, you, you talked about like program like TV, but like, for, would connected TV be mm -hmm. the size of a market, do you think? Will that be the, the chunk of it, and then the rest of it sort of is taken up by the program TV piece? I think you're always going to have traditional TV, right? I don't think that that necessarily goes away. But if you start to, if you if you take Barb data and you model it out, what you're seeing is kind of this. If I'm looking at uh, Barb data here in the UK and I'm looking at uh, total TV hours, it's it, it relatively stays the same. But if I break that down by age group, what you start to see is this. So you've got this kind of this is your your uh, 55 uh, really 45 plus crowd here. It kind of levels out, and then what you're seeing over the past 10 years is um, the idea that you're 44 and under crowd in your demographics down here are starting to move away from TV. And what you're seeing is kind of this separation in the market that I've seen in other industries where this happens. And what this what this points to is the next generation of consumers is looking at being able to Consume. get to a pay TV mm. package, take it and take it to all of their devices, mm. no matter what it is, and not have to worry about a set-top box. Mm. They want to plug it into an internet, a Wi-Fi connection, a 5G oh, or a 4G connection. And it's there, and that's going to be their expectation. And we see um, really high spikes around things like live events and other things where people, if you think about a sporting game, you may not always be uh, sitting at home uh, in front of your 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 um, your TV. You may be at work because it's across the world, like the World Cup event. You may be, um, you know, at uh, at work or in between things. And what you see is people come out, and the OTT live streaming is is really high. And I, I call it OTT because that anything delivered uh, essentially over the top, but. Yeah. And in Europe, do you think this is going to be uh, uh, the publishers maybe Obviously, we talked about Euro the US example there, but is there a lot of European publishers or TV on uh, media owners moving in that direction as well? Yeah, I mean, like, for example, we work with TV Player here um, in the UK, and, um, you know, we work with, um, you know, some RTL properties in, in, like, the Netherlands, for example, where we're starting to do, like, live sporting events and these things. Um, we are starting to see this uh, increase. We were just at the Connected TV Summit um, this last week. Um, and as part of that, you know, you really can kind of hear from all of the different uh, media owners, publishers, pay TV providers, broadcasters that are all talking about the solutions that they're, they're starting to plan for and bring to market, particularly around live. Um, mm. A lot of this has happened right now around VOD and catch-up services, mm. right? What you're seeing in the U.S. is a real, um, I would say, kind of a really aggressive embracement of uh, the idea that live and linear just becomes Internet. Is, um, there, is there a reason for that? I mean, obviously, there was news today that uh, Facebook basically bought up a lot of baseball rights for uh, all the baseball for Friday night, and they're going to stream it on Facebook Live, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Well, if you look at those guys, I think all of them, um, you know, all of those kind of walled gardens are interested in sports rights. and Which is a great way to get, uh, Sky proved here, it's a great way to win audience and build subscriptions. One was 1.7 billion for the premiership. The, you know, the premiership. Yeah. Now the, the question is, does that go to 2.5 billion? And can Sky afford it at 2.5 billion? But can they afford it at 4 billion? Facebook can because it got free cash. So so that that becomes a question as yeah. to whether, uh, as you look at that, and I think that's another reason why um, people have to kind of toe in so aggressively now to understand mm. how to build up their stacks and and get into this space to, mm. to kind of meet the needs of the next audience because what's happening is. You've got these borderless competitors, these walled gardens that are coming in with their own data sets. And, and, and their own distribution pieces. Own distribution right? pieces. They've got loads of cash, mm. and they're thinking about uh, sucking up uh, you know, sports rights, which are driving a lot of the, the consumption. And a lot of people keep their pay TV subscriptions based on sports access mm. because a lot of the other VOD stuff is replaceable through SVOD services and similar. So publishers need to, uh, and publishers media owners, really need to figure out how they're going to enable this data layer, how they're going to get themselves on a platform uh, like SpotX so that they can compete against the walled gardens. Mm. They can make their inventory available to the buyers who simply want to make it easier to buy. I yeah. mean, we, we talked to uh, several you know, big agencies and, and brands that were kind of talking about, you know, the way they want to operate in this space. And all of them said um, in one of the sessions that I was in was, just make it easier for me to be able to access 
your inventory because I'm sitting here, I'm ready to I'm ready to spend, but right now, you know, going up and turn, turn, going through this can get really complicated mm. for us. It's hard to plan. It's hard to you know pull off by a reach and in some instances because the other guys make it easier, basically. Yeah, the other guys yeah. make it very very easy. Mm. And the other thing is, once you move into here, um, I think there's been some industry. Um, you know, debate about which measurement kind of happens, but we've heard a lot about, you know, as we, we move into connected television, um, you know, whether it becomes, you know, rating points and GRP data, whether it becomes digitally measured, whether it becomes a blend of these and there's going to be a unique audience. And, um, you know, what I've seen is the people that have the most interest in buying on this side has tended to be uh, the digitally focused people and they want to be able to apply that one-to-one -one, uh, metrics and attribution and tracking and, and measurement that they have. Um, in the digital space in here, and that's very attractive to them. So there you have it. If you're afraid of Facebook and Google destroying your business, you have to go and talk to Alan Kay because he could solve your problems. Alan, that was great overview. Thank you very much for coming to the office today. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Trade TV.